So we can already see little sort of uh, creeping inroads in which politics is guiding science. And time and again in, the, in recent years, we've had examples of a government policy overriding scientific advice. This has happened in bioethics, where we have uh, ethical decisions, ethical advice being given to the government. Uh, the government uh, overrides that advice and just uh, goes uh, the way they think they want to go because they think they know the answer. <clears throat> this has happened in the FDA. We have a, a drug that should be made available to the American public, just as it has been made to Europeans. And that drug, for what really seems to be religious reasons, is being inhibited from being provided to the American public. Uh, we have uh, various environmental advice, advisory committees being overridden by uh, politicians who want to uh, uh, do something that in fact goes very much against uh, environmental policy uh, and very much against the advice given by scientists. Uh, we have the um, greenhouse effect. We have the greenhouse effect basically being ignored uh, and the science that underlies it being questioned by politicians who are doing it for political ends and economic ends and really not taking the advice being given to them by scientists who know what they're talking about, who are using the best scientific knowledge. So time and again, we are seeing uh, politics overriding scientific advice. And uh, this is not the way it should be. Politics should be guided by scientific advice because uh, in the long run, we're going to suffer if we don't heed that advice. Science is definitely under siege today. I, when I read about the politicization of the scientific decision-making process in Washington, it's very scary and very upsetting. When I read about the appointment of committees that are supposedly offering um, a neutral scientific or scientifically valid advice, uh, and I see that those committees are being stacked with people who are ideologically one position or another, that's very upsetting. When I see that the uh, decision makers in Washington have cut back seriously on research, on data collection, on the um, uh, information that must be available to congressmen in order to make good, sound, empirically based decisions, I get very distressed about that as well. I think there are a lot of assaults on science in the current political climate, and I th find it very, very disturbing. I think most scientists would. If you're going to consider the status of science as a whole, um, the strength of science as a discipline, then I think you have to situate, you have to locate intelligent design as being part of a larger attack on science that we're seeing politically, because the intelligent design movement is really about politics and using politics to, to advance a religious attack on science, on the credibility of science. It's been very difficult to get science, scientists, the scientific community, to take intelligent design creationism seriously. They want to lump it in with all the other silly forms of creationism that they've dismissed as the lunatic fringe, but I think they're seeing that this particular form of creationism has a political strength, that when you combine that with what scientists are experiencing directly, with science, the government's science committees being undermined, with uh, science funding sometimes being threatened, I think now they realize that the intelligent design movement is part of a much larger, very deliberate, very well orchestrated attack on the way they do their science and they see that the integrity of their discipline is under attack. The more we allow fundamentalist, sectarian, religious beliefs to influence how we conduct our national and international affairs, the more we are pushed back 
to a period of time that precedes the Enlightenment. Our country was founded on Enlightenment beliefs. The Enlightenment was a time that followed the Renaissance. The Renaissance when people were discovering all sorts of great ideas, Galileo, Da Vinci, people like that. And the Enlightenment embodied in many respects, although it wasn't a, you know, a lockstep movement, but more and more people were coming to understand that, that the world was tractable to natural solutions, to generalizations, to understandings about patterns and processes that did not require supernatural intervention, that could be quantified and described mathematically, that could be modeled and categorized, and that there would be predictable outcomes of this, that there, there would be historical outcomes, essentially looking in the past of geology, the history of life, and so forth, even the history of the universe. All of these things were part of the Enlightenment. And our system of democracy was one of the systems that came out of the Enlightenment, that accepted that people were equal, that denied the divine right of kings, that said, well, if, if there are supernatural forces, and many people believe these sorts of things, that no church is going to have priority or even establishment in this country. The French Revolution, another example of the people who did it, that in a rather different way, and in England, of course, many things changed too. Germany, all the countries you can think about emerging from the Enlightenment in this way. And what we have in this country today are people who are trying to push us back to before those Enlightenment times, even before much of the Renaissance, where they thought they could discover things about the world, to a kind of a dark ages, where we're actually, you know, a, a medieval period where we're being governed by superstition and prejudice. This is, this is not the kind of world that was envisioned by our founding fathers, and not that we should be slavish to that, but please remember these people are writing in the late 1700s. It's centuries ago, and they're eons farther along this scale than the people who are trying to push us back before it. The rest of the world thinks we're crazy to be squandering all this. And this is playing itself out in the way we conduct our national business. Because of the, the stranglehold that fundamentalists have on so many people in government. I do not know why mainstream theologians and religious practitioners aren't taking a stand on this. I don't know this because they're losing people every week out of their pews to the preachers who are claiming that they can, are the only people who can save these people from the demonized world of of scientists and all the other people that they don't like and they just want to put a, a label on them. It accounts for the curious affinity between fundamentalist Christians and Zionists. These are people who want Armageddon to come, who are perfectly happy with the ruin of the environment because that brings us closer to Armageddon. It's the whole left behind group of people. The whole revelations as what's going to happen, the whole day of reckoning stuff. This is, these are people who have lost control of dealing with what is in the actual material world. They don't want to know about this. They want to know about how they're going to be saved. Yes, there are green Christians, the ones who think that God gave us the world for our stewardship for dominion, that it's our responsibility to take care of it. But their voices are currently not as strong as the people who are just as happy to see it destroyed if it brings them closer to Jesus faster. And the interesting thing is that we have a very strong group of Muslims who feel a very complimentary way. So the problem we face in the 21st century is not about science versus religion, it's about religion versus rationality.